Hi Whovians, Harry here and the third and final special of the Doctor Who 60th Anniversaries, The Giggle, recently aired and I know I keep seeing it every like video but this episode was the most bonkers Doctor Who episode ever. Uh, definitely the most bonkers when in this in these three specials but it was just so crazy like that there was the toy maker like London in anarchy um a by regeneration like a, a possible master return is just so crazy and amazing and I just wanted to go over my thoughts and well how I, what I thought about this episode and was it good? But before we get into that, don't forget to subscribe, also leave a like and comment down below, and let's get in to the video. So, as I said, this episode was bonkers and crazy. It it started off, like, really creepy, um, with, um, like, Neil Patrick Harris's The Toy Maker's, like, um, toy shop, and the assistant of, like, John Logie Bard come in in to buy, um, um, well, um, Stooky Bill, and, um, Russell T. Davis teased us in, when the first trailer aired of that man walking into, um, Neil Patrick Harris or the Toymaker's toy shop, and it turned out to just be the assistant of, uh, John Logie Bard. Um, uh, well, thank you for teasing us with that, Russell. He turned out to not be that big, uh, a, a character. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks for that. Also, so then it goes on, and of course, um, Neil Patrick Harris, he has a really, like, hammed up German accent. It is obviously, I think he's doing it, it's like, intentionally that way. Um, I know in Doctor Who Unleashed, Neil Patrick Harris said that um, the script was written in the way that it had these, um, like, Germanisms? I don't know if that's right. Sorry. So, sorry if that's wrong, uh, but it was written in that way so that the way Neil Patrick Harris performed it was how it was written. And is I think it's very intentional. It's not designed to be a serious German accent or a serious British accent or a, or even a serious American accent. Um, it's just designed to... He's like playing with everyone because, of course, he's the toy maker he plays. Uh, that's his main thing. And I think his accents are part of that. And then it is revealed that by this assistant buying um, Stooky Bill from the toy maker's toy shop, the toy maker has like implanted the human race um, with like a sort of infection that they will think they're right all the time and that will just basically cause a massive fight. And the toy maker actually reveals later in the episode that every human wants to be right all the time. So he made every opinion correct. And that by their opinions being correct, they don't have the, like, uh, mind to dial back and be like, oh, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I apologise. They think they're correct, and then by, like, tormenting them with a giggle, it makes them even more angry, um, and by their, like, people thinking they're laughing at them for being correct, it makes them even more angry, and that's why the human race is in massive chaos. Picking up from where the last episode, um, Wild Blue Yonder left off, um, and it's kind of, um, well, the Doctor, Donna, and Wolf come into contact with, of course, the human race being angry, and he even bumps into the toy maker. David Tennant's um, 14th Doctor bumps into the toy maker, and he has, like, this kind of moment of, like, relevant, like, like, kind of, re like, thinking, is that the toy maker? When he's being, um, like, uh, transported to unit HQ by unit. Um, but it's, he doesn't know until he enters the toy maker's shop. And also, it's just fun, uh, it's so, it's sad, but, um, of course, Wilf actually wasn't in this episode because his final scene was in Wild Blue Yonder. That was his only scene in the Doctor Who 60th anniversary specials. They had a body double for him. And the line is a recycled line from the Sontaran um, two-parter back in series four. But it was really nice to have at least some semblance of Bernard Cribbin in this episode. It's just, um, it's nice. And I like how it gets an open ending. Um, 
at this, like he still, it's implied at the end of this episode that Wolf is still alive in the Doctor Who universe. So that's nice. And then, of course, we go to Unit HQ. They have a big Avenger-style tower. It's amazing. And um, the Doctor realises that um, Stooky Bill has been affecting everyone. And um, we get this um, great shot of, like, well, this great um, scene where Kate Stewart takes off her armband that is keeping all the Unit um, soldiers um, sane. And um, she, like, goes insane and goes really mad at her. Uh, the doctor calling him an alien and that he shouldn't be like um that he should be arrested or killed um because he's an alien and uh telling um shirley that uh um like um she has seen um her walk which is way out of line um but um they they put the bracelet back on it i thought there was a time where she would like when she took the bracelet off she would like destroy it like stamp on it but she didn't um i guess that they already had too much to deal with without an evil um, uh, Kate Stewart running about the place as well. Um, and also, in Unit HQ, there is a returning Doctor Who companion that was leaked by Disney and then revealed by the BBC. That Mal Bush, companion to the 6th and 7th Doctors, has returned. And it's just so nice. I wish we got to see more of, like, the Doctor interacting with Mal. Um, I guess we didn't get much because there was just so much to wrap up um, in this episode. But it was just so nice to see a couple of scenes between the 14th Doctor and Mal, and also the 15th Doctor, coming later in this episode. Um, and it was just so nice that after all this time from Dragonfire in the 7th Doctor's era, to Mal not seeing the Doctor for all that time, to finally be, well, reunited again with the Doctor, is just so nice. And um, Donna... Um, comments that she wasn't the first ginger haired companion and also she wasn't the last ginger haired companion either well she kind of is if you count the 60th anniversary specials well we don't know dr 16 or might have a, a ginger haired companion or maybe when millie gibson leaves i know she hasn't even arrived yet but maybe she will have a ginger haired companion we don't know we don't know it's just um funny to have that um like, little line in there. And then the Doctor realising that Stooky Bill has infected every screen ever, and that's the reason the human race are angry, goes back him in time and comes into contact with the... Well, he, he sees the toy maker shop where he's selling puppets, and he goes in there and he realises that this is the toy maker, and we get shots of their um, first... Um, out in with um, the first Doctor going up against the toy maker in the serial, The Celestial Toy Maker. Unfortunately, there's only one episode of that um, serial remaining, but it's still uh, good. I've watched that and it, I just to prepare for this episode, and it was quite good. Um, a bit anticlimactic, but then the games in this episode was also a bit anticlimactic because he goes that the ball is the first game and hide and seek was the second game and like cards was another early game i don't know it's kind of weird but it goes along the fact that the toy maker that the doctor won the first um game against the toy maker the toy maker then wins the second game against the 14th doctor and then they play for the third and final game best out of three um later in this episode with the 14th and 15th Doctor versus the Toymaker. Yes, yeah, so as I said, um, they have a best out of three games because the Toymaker obviously is trap has trapped the Doctor and Donna in his toy room. And um, they um, and he kind of tortures the Doctor saying that um, Amy died and Clara died and Bill died and then the whole universe, well, half the universe got wiped out by the events of the Flux. And the Doctor tries to justify this by saying, like, Amy um, died of old age, Clara is living a life um, going around the universe in her TARDIS with a shielder, and Bill's consciousness survived um, and became like a cosmic entity with her girlfriend Heather, and the event of the flux wasn't his fault. And Neil Patrick Harris responds in a really, like, camp and over-the-top accent of, like, oh, well, that's okay then! I know that was a terrible impression, just terrible. Um, but yeah, it's like, 
the Doctor did kind of lead to Amy's death, Clara's death, Bill's death, and the destruction of half the universe. And that is weighing on him. And Neil Patrick Harris is driving this home. His celestial toy maker is driving this home. And just... Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad that... He's, he's, he's dealing with all these losses since having Donna. And... A lot of his friends have died, along with a lot of the universe. And then, as I said, they play a fir um, a second game with cards, and it's basically splitting the deck or something, and the person that um, picks up the deck and has the highest card wins, and the Doctor actually loses. And as the toy maker is about to trap the Doctor and Donna as, like, puppets in his um, universe, the Doctor says, but, wait, You've won this game, but I won the game all the way back when I was the first Doctor um, back in your toy room. So we need to play a best out of Frey. And he goes, fine, we'll make it 2020 Frey. And um, he can just step into 2020 Frey. And then once the Doctor and Donna make their way back to 2020 Frey um, unit HQ, he has a really camp dancing, like a musical scene. It's just so crazy. I love the musical scene. And he terrorizes everyone because he dances with Kate Stewart, throws her into a wall, um, he dances with Malbush, throws her um like um down onto the floor, um he dances with well, he uh, jump scares Shirley, um he turns are uh, these poor unit soldiers just doing as they were told into like balls um uh, and kills them. Uh, it's insane. And then he takes control of this giant cannon. I forget what it's called. Um, it uh, does have a name. I forget what it's called right now, though. Um, but, yeah, it's just insane and crazy. And then he goes, Okay, you played the first game as the first incarnation of the Doctor. You've played this game as the 14th incarnation of the Doctor. I want to play this third game with the next Doctor. And fires, like, a beam at David Tennant's chest. And, like kills him, and as he's, and, like, he regenerates, and this is, like, not even 45 minutes into the episode, and he is regenerating, and I was like, what? They're not gonna do the regeneration right now, and then he, like, kind of stops, he's like, what? And he's like, um, Mal, Donna, can you help? And they pull him, like, apart, and shoot, he comes out of him, and this is insane and crazy, the 15th Doctor making his first appearance, and he pulls him out, and then it's just really weird, because the 14th Doctor's clothes, like, split, like, Shooty is wearing the tie, the shirt, and then boxer shorts. I don't know why Shooty doesn't have an outfit on, since when, um, the 13th Doctor regenerated into the 14th, the 14th Doctor's clothes came out, um, so it really seems like Russell is picking and choosing what he wants to bring to Doctor Who, because if the Doctor can make the clothes, why not this time? Or if he can't make clothes, why did he do it from 13 to 14? Um, but I digress. It was really amazing to see the 15th Doctor. I didn't think we get him this soon. I didn't think we'd see a bi-regeneration. Like, Shooty tells the Doctor and us, the audience, that this is a bi-regeneration, something hardly ever seen before. But it's amazing to see, like, this bi-regeneration. Uh, something we've never seen before. It's just so crazy, but we finally have had a multi-Doctor story in the 60th anniversary. Something that a lot of fans never thought would happen. So, then, with two Doctors... Oh, it's just so great again. Um, they march up to the toy maker and says they challenge him to a game. And he's like, it's not fair. Why are there two of you? And he's like... Well, well, you did this. You, you, you created both of us, and he has to suck it up because the toy maker has to obey by the rules of the game. So they play the first game, catch. Um, and what I actually forgot to mention earlier is the um toy maker has a gold tooth, which is implied to be the master. Now, whether this is John Sim, Michelle Gomez or the Dewan Master, probably the Dewan Master, or maybe even a new incarnation entirely, the Toy Maker has trapped the Master, one of the biggest threats in the Doctor Who universe, in his tooth. What? Whoa, that is just, in well, crazy. And the 14th Doctor and 15th Doctor have to work together to 
um, basically, if the person who drops the ball um, loses and they manage to make Neil Patrick Harris, like, the ball skims past his hand and then um, falls, and um, they win. And what I, I'm a bit disappointed we didn't get to see more of the toy maker because after that, he is shrunk up into the box. And, 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 like, he's trapped, or, or, like, he's not dead, because the first Doctor said he can never die. But they've defeated him, and it's a bit quick. Like, like, it's just sort of wrapped up really quick. I, ex I was expecting, like, a really big, exciting game, like an obstacle course filled with amazing things. Like, just think of, um, I'm a Celebrity. The last I'm a Celebrity was, um, oh, uh, what's it called? Um... Oh, the one with the stars, where they, and there's this water cannon with massive balls, and they have to put the stars down. Um, that, I, I, I wanted something like that in Doctor Who. Something really exciting, something tense, rather than just playing catch. And that's how the toy maker is defeated. Um, a bit of a letdown, but, um, that's what we get. However, that is not it, though, because we then join uh, the 14th Doctor, the 15th Doctor, and Donna in the TARDIS, and she, she's like, well, I, I should probably continue going throughout the universe. Look, you've been through a lot. Like, um, I think they, they say Adric's death, um, the, the Flux event, um, I think there's something about Fenric in there, um, so of course his time with Ace. And also, the bit that, like, almost, well, brought me to tears, that Sarah Jane Smith is dead in, in the Doctor Who universe. I know she passed away years ago now, and it, that was sad. But she was implied to maybe still be alive in the Doctor Who universe, but she is dead. And it's just so sad to see that all these people that the Doctor has had throughout time and space, they've all died. And this Doctor, Shuchi, um, the 15th Doctor, implies that Dave is the 14th Doctor, needs therapy. He needs to relax, he needs to retire. And he does. Um, Shuchi, um, gives him a new TARDIS by hitting the TARDIS with, a, like, a Harley Quinn bat. Um, which is just weird. But then Shuchi goes off on his travels um, to the new Christmas special we'll see at Christmas uh, with his new companion Ruby Sunday and the 14th Doctor has a life living with Donna. He is literally retired with the Mott uh, Temple noble family and it's just so great. He has a family, finally. Like, like it, it reminded me a bit of like Journey's End where he's like, Every, all of his other friends have a family, or Sarah Jane Smith um, at the end of, I think, series one, where she goes, in all the universe, I never thought I'd have a family. And that really hit me in the feels too, uh, that uh, he is part of the family now, and has, like, a niece um, in uh, Rose Noble, and uh, a best friend, and brother-in-law, and, and uh, uh, like, mother-in-law kind of... Um, and then another, like, friend and aunt um, in Malbush. And that is just sad and crazy and amazing. And also, I want to know, like, 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 does this mean that the 14th Doctor can regenerate? We now have two um, David Tennant Doctors living domestic lives. The Metacrisis one in, um, well, the Metacrisis Doctor living in the parallel world with Rose Tyler, and now this one living a domestic life with Donna's family. Um, in the main timeline. Does that mean he'll come back at the end of Shooty's series? We know Mal Bush is coming back um, in um, th at the end of Shooty's first series. Does this mean the 14th Doctor also is coming back as well? Uh, that would be crazy. Also, is this just a cash grab? Because David Tennant's the best Doctor. They have to get all that cash from him. A Tennant Tate spin-off I'm a bit worried about because just to get cash from the old casual viewers that remember Dave Tennant as their favourite and still think he's, well, he's still their favourite. So is that just a cash grab? Hopefully not. And also, we got to see um, on the unit HQ a lady um, with red um, nail polish, like, pick up the gold tooth that had the Master's Consciousness in it. 
So does this mean that well, we'll get the return of the master? Um, maybe it's a like a Har uh, Harold Saxon resurrection that we had at the end of time. Um, maybe it's not even a woman. Everyone's been speculating it. It's a woman. Maybe it's a man who's just got red nail polish on. I don't know. But uh, if we see the master return and we get an even more unhinged or maybe even another redemptive master, that would just be amazing. I can't wait. Shuchi's uh, new era is just amazing. This episode was crazy. I don't know what was happening for a lot of it. By regeneration, master return, toy maker defeated. Uh, I just think it was amazing and incredible. But I am a tiny bit worried that we might just be relying too much on Tenant. But that is a problem or a question for the future. But as I said, I think this episode was amazing. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. And also, if you liked this video, don't forget to leave a like. And I can't wait for Shooty's next series. Don't forget to subscribe and also share it. I, I will see you at Christmas. Well, before Christmas, but that is when Doctor Who is returning. See you then.